Et Yann Volker va, euh, je crois, parler en anglais. Oui, comme font tous les Allemands. Hein. Ce qui n'est simplement le signe que d'une débâcle du français en Allemagne. Et il va parler de Abed qui parle, Ahmed who is speaking. Et euh, bien que ceci puisse apparaître et est, en un certain sens, euh, concerne ce, le registre théâtral de mon œuvre, c'est-à-dire la série des Ahmed, en réalité, il s'agit bien aussi et peut-être principalement de l'intervention de Ahmed dans l'immanence des vérités, puisque toute une série des, des pièces de Ahmed de philosophe sont reprises, insérées, incarnées dans le livre, comme elles l'avaient été en réalité dans les séminaires d'origine du livre. Et donc, euh, voilà, ben je, laisse, je laisse Yann Merci. expliquer Merci, je, je une copie. ça vision de Ahmed dans cette affaire. Merci, bonsoir. Tout d'abord, euh, j'aimerais euh, remercier Alain pour cette invitation. Je suis heureux d'être ici. Et deuxièmement, euh, j'étais sûr et je savais qu'il y, qu y a une nécessité d'une autocritique pour, euh, pour le simple fait que je vais parler en anglais. Mais maintenant, autocritique achevée, je peux <rire> commencer. Euh, et je change en, en anglais. So the title is Ahmed, who is speaking. Um, I want to draw your attention to a very small detail in L'Immanence des Vérités, or rather to a series of small details, which to my understanding nevertheless leads to a quite difficult or leads to quite difficult consequences. Ahmed himself is not what I would dare to call a small detail, but there is a series of remarkable details concerning the conditions of his appearances throughout the book. I will propose that Ahmed becomes, in the strong sense of the word, that is, it is a development of its own, so Ahmed becomes an inner philosophical but non-philosophical voice of the philosophy written by the philosopher named Badiou. That's <laughs> Ça va continuer comme ça. But let us go step by step and begin with three observations. In L'Emanence de Vérité, Ahmed reappears, reappears on six different occasions. At each of this, these six occasions, a short extract is presented in which Ahmed is either involved in a dialogue, tells a story, or is immersed in a monologue. All of these appearances come under the heading of Theat theatrical interludes, and therefore, in the organization of the book, they take a specific role. They form a kind of interstices, and we are supposed to think that these interludes, in the classical understanding, follow their own rules, apart from the main text. We know that the category of an interlude mainly belongs to the theater, and speaking of theatrical interludes makes this reference explicit here. In relation to the theater, we think of the interlude as a sort of short divertissement in between two acts of a theater play. Usually, we have an act, an interlude, and then the next act. Apart from the theater, but still imminently linked to it, the interlude takes on a more broad sense and might also refer to a period of time. It, des it designates then a form of an interval. In L'Emanence de Vérité, most of these interludes are introduced rather briefly. Often they are connected to the text that frames them in a rather loose way. In one moment, Badiou tells us that we will go through an argument again with the help of the theatrical enactment. At another moment, we are just being told that now the theater has its play. Introductions like these refer to the more illustrative function of the interludes. But there is more. Besides the rather illustrating purpose, some of the theatrical passages are also being commented within the main text. And one of the interludes also serves as a basis for a deduction of three theses. We should note that these theses, which are being drawn from a story told by Ahmed, then happen to be theses on the notion of evil. So 
already from this rough and cursory overview, we see that the situation is actually rather complex. We can understand the illustrative function as a moment of the classical divertisement, but this moment is mixed with something more, which we might then understand as an excess and of and over the amusement. Against this background, the function of the interludes within the organization of the book becomes our question. And this question entails several aspects. First of all, regarding the aspect of the divertisement. Can we at all take the interludes as a form of amusement if some of them are being commented on and if another serves as a basis for a thesis on the notion of evil? How would we understand amusement or divertisement within philosophy? And once this amusement exceeds its proper role and compels the philosophical text to comment, react, or even deduce thesis from it, how do we understand the relation between amusement and its excess? Our first remark in relation to Ahmed's appearance or appearances can be turned into a first complication. We see that it is not sufficient to take Ahmed's interludes simply as illustrative, amusing parentheses. But they are still interludes and therefore they do not belong to the main line of the philosophical argument. Thus, in one word, we are dealing with interludes of which it is very difficult to say how they relate to the main text to which they are an interlude. So this is the first problem. And this first problem is a problem of the formal relation between interlude and act. But next to it, we find a second complication. And this second complication also unfolds itself on a formal level. But in comparison to the first complication that concerned two different types of text, we now will look or take a look at the identities of this couple, Badiou Ahmed. So I, I'm, I'm always saying Ahmed because in Germany you say Ahmed and so in the French you say Ahmed. But so now we're going to take a look at these identities of this one couple, Badiou Ahmed, a couple speaking and acting throughout the entire book. As I already mentioned, at one moment, Ahmed tells a story from which afterwards the thesis on the notion of the evil will be deduced. And now our second complication begins even before Ahmed actual, Ahmed's actual story begins. The second complication begins when Badiou introduces this story by telling us that he, Badiou, will now reproduce a story that has been told to him by his friend Ahmed. And but you additionally remarks that Ahmed usually addresses him as the dear philosophy professor. And then he informs us, but you, that he has, but you deems this form of an address to be a little aggressive. As it seems to reveal that Ahmed himself considers himself to be the real philosopher. In distinction, of course, from the dear philosophy professor, where the emphasis lies on the professor. This is a mocking remark, for sure. But the question is a very old one and not at all easy to solve, namely whether the real philosopher can be a professor. It is a dense problem. Maybe the word professor attacks a certain sophistry, but then again, this very attack also does perhaps forget the necessity of an institution for philosophy. Now be this as it may for a moment. The attacked one here is the author and as an author, he has the power to close this remark by adding that Ahmed is forgiven, for he is a friend, as the professor writes. But, but Ahmed is not that powerless, as one might think. Ahmed is not a victim of the text. We remember that in another passage of the, uh, the play, Ahmed Revient, Ahmed quotes a philosopher named Badiou, whom he calls his colleague adding that one is never forced to believe his colleague but you. It happens then that this passage of all is not reproduced in L'Immanence de Verité. Ahmed's position is strong here, for he relates to the other as to another worker, a colleague, and not to the symbolic inscription. The text will not be able to erase this, for we find already in the mockery of the dear philosophy professor an ironic reference to the imaginary surplus attached to the name or to the symbol professor. 
once Ahmed's mockery is rejected, Ahmed's position becomes retroactively, one could say, stronger than before. And so we find a broad mixture, a friend, a colleague, a little fight as to who is the real professor or to who is the real philosopher, a couple, an irony, a mockery. Between the actor of the interludes, Ahmed, and the author, the philosopher named Badiou, much more is going on than could possibly be captured in the relation of an interlude and the acts that frame it. But things are even more odd, and our second complication is not finished yet. In another scene, another interlude, also in Emanence de Vérité, we find the philosopher named Badiou reasoning about his mobile phone, comparing the beauty of two mobile phones from the same product line but of different series. The indicated scenery is a seminar room, the philosopher named Badiou teaching a class on the question of repetition. So while he's trying to unfold his comparison, he receives a call. First tries to put the caller off till 10 days later, but then leaves the stage. A couple of minutes later, he reappears with two uh, uh, doubles at his side. Directly after this short scene, which we cannot call but call a prelude to an interlude, a scene from the play Ahmed Revient is reproduced. We are not given any indication about the relation of these two parts. Ahmed himself appears in the following scene with two doubles and embroils them in a complex questioning. And then, third part, still under the heading of a theatrical interlude, the text, not Ahmed's text, and not the text about Badiou giving a seminar, but the rest of the text, the main text, continues, beginning with the statement that the author feels himself reminded of Kierkegaard. Thus, the confusion is absolutely perfect. Not only we have the philosopher named Badiou as a figure within a theatrical interlude itself, but we also do have the same philosopher named Badiou continuing his philosophical argument just after he had an appearance in a theatrical scene. These Badiou's cannot be the same, and these Ahmed's cannot be the same. So doubles, doubles, everywhere we look. But they cannot all be doubles, for if the double is not the double of someone, we lose the double as well. So everywhere we look, who is not double here? So in this second complication, we are led into a difficulty concerning the two identities and their relation. This difficulty unfolds in two steps. At first, we have the confusion between the philosopher named Badiou, who considers Ahmed to be his friend, and the real philosopher Ahmed, who considers the philosopher named Badiou to be his colleague, although a not fully trustworthy colleague. We have to conclude that Ahmed and Badiou know each other. Now, at this point, I'm fully aware that one might think that what is happening here is an expression of the freedom of the poet, namely to suggest that his hero knows his author personally. And then we could also understand that the philosopher named Badiou not only suggests knowing his friend Ahmed, but also quotes from his monologues and dialogues. I'm not interested in this solution at all, because it is not convincing and rather covers up something else. Of course, there's nothing to say against quoting a friend. This happens from time to time. And of course, it is also possible to quote a play in which the one who quotes, that is the author, is being addressed by the one who is quoted, namely the hero of the play. And still, you could say, but you is quoting himself. As an author can write himself into his own play, why not? But at a moment at which the author refers to the hero of his own play outside, to the, or to the hero of his own play outside, of the play as to a friend, something else takes place. Once again, one might be tempted to do away with this as a form of access by which the hero of the play, Ahmed, enters different areas of textual existence, and in the end, this refers to a specific idiosyncrasy of Badiou as the author who somehow disorganizes the places of his characters and heroes. To be sure, Nobody in this room doubts that Ahmed is a fictional character of whom the philosopher named Badiou is the author. And the point in question is not to claim that it would be the other way around, although Ahmed might enjoy this version. The point is rather that the author, our philosopher named Badiou, 
undermines his, author, his own authorship and that we lose the distinction between the fictionality and the reality of the person named Ahmed. So we not only find the confusion between the two names, but we find a more fundamental confusion in the relation to the reality and the fictionality of the two names. There is something fictional in the professor named Badiou, something, <laughs> exceeding the real person, but there is also something real in Ahmed, exceeding Ahmed as the character of a play. After these two complications on, and on the basis of them, we have to finally note a third complication. First, we have the complication of the relation between interlude and act. And second, we have the complication concerning the reality and fictionality of the couple named Ahmed Badiou. But now, we have to consider a third irritation that concerns someone we might call us. Who is this person named Ahmed actually addressing when he begins, for example, by saying, I will tell you an extremely funny story? Who's you? The colleague but you? We as readers? As readers of the main text or as readers of the interludes? We know from different scenes that Ahmed likes to mingle with the audience. And if we identify this you, which Ahmed is addressing as the audience, then again the easiest solution would be to understand by audience the audience of some performance of the play, Ahmed Revient. There seems to be nothing uh, uh, about which we would have to worry here. So if Ahmed says you, he speaks to some hypothetical audience. But it is also clear that this kind of clarity is only possible if those scenes in which Ra Ahmed reappears are understood as quotes from a play called Ahmed Revient. Once again, the entire problem disappears if we take Ahmed only as a fictional character from a play that is being quoted in Limanence de Vérité. But it is also, once again, the strange relationship between the author, the philosopher named Badiou, and his friend and colleague, Ahmed, that prohibits us from this understanding. Based on the complication of the relation between acts and interludes, and based on the complication of the identity of the two figures, Badiou and Ahmed, Ahmed's address is no, now an open address. He speaks to Badiou, his do doubles, to a hypothetical audience, to us as readers. And this is our third complication. The first irritation or complication stems from the relation between interludes and acts. The second concerns the reality and fictionality, thus the identity of the author and the hero. And the third relates to the question of the audience. What are, we to, what are we supposed to think of these complications? In the remaining time, I will propose to link them to Badiou's philosophical work on the theater as it can be found elsewhere, above all in the Rhapsody for the Theater, a book, the material of which goes back to the late 80s. This time, as Badiou explains in the foreword, is a time in which Ahmed Le Subtil is being produced or written, but also the inc incident at Antioch, and it's also the time of being an event published in 1988. In the Rhapsody for the Theatre, we find a structure that corresponds with the three moments of complication caused by the theatrical interludes in Limanence de Vérité. But this is not to say that we find a solution, an explanation, a clarification for these complications in the Rhapsody. Or, to be more explicit, instead of understanding Ahmed's appearance according to Badiou's philosophy of theatre, I'm more interested in a further complication of the relation between philosophy and theater. And therefore, I will not go into any details of the rhapsody. The rest of my declaration here will rather tend toward an abbreviated form in the direction of thesis. Three moments in the rhapsody. In the rhapsody, we find a distinction between an analytic of the theater on the one hand and its dialectic on the other. The analytic categorizes the elements that necessarily belong to the theater. There are seven, among them director, actor, audience, stage, and so, and so on. As its dialectic, which is of interest for us here, we get three essential movements which the theater carries out. The first dialectical movement concerns the figure of the state. The second concerns the question of an ethics, and the third relates to the spectator of the play of the play. So to begin with the state, but you remarks that the theater is from its beginning on inscribed into a close relation to the state. It is actually a form of the state. 
But as it is also taking place in a specific distance from the state to which it belongs, the theater represents the state, or in Badiou's words, it represents representation. The theater, so to speak, distances or alienates the state, and this is the reason why the theater as a form of the state is dangerous to the state, because it does present the things as they are in an alienated form. Second, the question of ethics turns around the couple of identities and differences, fundamentally being challenged by the theatrical capacity of imitation. The actor is able to imitate anyone he likes to imitate. But the even more radical capacity of imitation in the theater is shown when not something or someone is being imitated, but rather the play of the play takes place and the process of imitation as such is being played. Between these two forms of imitation, the theater decides about its own form. In the first imitation, we stick to the impression that there is something to be imitated. An actor imitates a substantial individual and the spectator will recognize this individual. In the second imitation, the play of the play, which this, or in the second imitation, this secured form of recognition is suspended. The spectator is now left without any possibility to seek refuge in recognition. The spectator is compelled to think. So when the second form of imitation shows differences to be differences without substances and compels the spectator to think, we already have the third moment of the dialectics of the theater. In the true theater, that is the theater that does not provide possible identifications, the spectator is compelled to think. If theater works, then the spectator is forced to overcome his or her laziness and is being forced to think. But what is thinking? Thinking in this case is the participation and inscription in the idea that is being unfolded on stage. Once the spectator is not seeking to identify him or herself with an apparently familiar char character, once the spectator does not pacify the theater as a play of recognition, but does instead follow the play as a process in which a theater idea is unfolded, the role of the spectator changes. The true spectator of the true theater is not only compelled to think, but is unknowingly being pushed into the position of the philosopher, the one who elucidates the idea that is taking place. So there is more to say. But for the conclusion, I will combine the first three moments of Ahmed, Ahmed's appearances with the three moments of the philosophical description of the theater and will squeeze a kind of conclusion from this combination that does not necessarily follow. First, the theatrical interludes in L'Emanence de Verité form an imminent measure of the state of philosophy. As interludes, they appear within philosophy, or they appear within the philosophy to which they belong, but to a certain degree they represent the, rep the representation of the philosophical work. They compel the philosophy to react as they belong to it, but they also exhibit a certain distance that is inscribed within this philosophy. And thus, by measuring this distance, they recall that there is a certain state of philosophy which needs to be exhibited. It is a force of the state within the state, re-inscribing the real cause of this philosophy into this philosophy. Ahmed, as a political actor, is actually Chinese. Second, the problem of, of the differences and identities between the philosopher named Badiou and the actor named Ahmed is actually a problem of the internal relation between philosophy and theater. But it is not at all a question of the dissolution of the boundaries between theater and philosophy. It is not a question of philosophy being theater and theater being philosophy. In L'Emanence de Verité, it is again an imminent problem. For philosophy to be philosophy, there is the necessity of a theatrical side to it. It is the question of one being an essential side of the other. For philosophy to be philosophy, there is a theatrical side to it. We saw in the Rhapsody that the essential moment of the true theater is not to imitate substances that might be recognized, 
but rather to play the play of imitation, so to initiate an imitation without substances. In Les Manons de Vérité, we saw that the relation between reality and fictionality is being undermined in the couple Badiou Ahmed. We lose everything once we think that Badiou is real and Ahmed is fiction. Nor is philosophy simply a form of theater. But philosophy needs to change its identity from time to time, according to the truth processes it follows. Philosophy needs to be able to change its form. Therefore, it needs theater to destabilize and to reinvent its own form. Philosophy can only change its form once it is imminently linked to the play of pure imitation. Third, we, the spectators. It is here that the actual aim of philosophy and, and its theater converge. Philosophy, from its theatrical point of view, compels its readers to think, turns its, reader, its readers into philosophers. The true aim of true philosophy, which is theatrical in one of its moments, is to turn us into philosophers. But at this point, it becomes difficult to say who's actually uttering this address to everybody. In Les Manons de Vérité, it is, as we have seen, not simply but you, and it is also not Ahmed. Let me then conclude with a fourth point, which refers at least once to my title, Ahmed, who is speaking. We can capture Ahmed on a phenomenological level, and I would propose to call him on a or to describe him on a phenomenological level in Les Manons de Vérité as definitely an Arab in a French setting and as such as a contem contemporary Chinese woman from the 60s. Ahmed appears within philosophy as a difference and distance within this very philosophy, but a difference and distance that compels the philosophy in which it appears to change its own form. It compels philosophy to exceed itself by the means of thinking. If it is impossible that a form compels itself to change and to exceed itself, then in Ahmed it is actually the process of Badiou's philosophy that makes itself heard. It is philosophy as a procedure that shows its theatrical face and speaks with a theatrical voice. Philosophy is real, we might say. It's impossible procedure. But then again, who knows? It's perhaps only the slight irritation by an amusing figure straying around in a philosophical text. Merci. Merci, merci Yann d'avoir tressé ce rapport dialectique subtil entre la philosophie et le théâtre à partir de mon duo avec Ahmed. Euh, 